My name is Bahir Chipsaz, part of Elite Mastermind Group. This is where we talk about success principles. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Yeah, so I'm tuning in for, from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and, and thank you for, for having me uh, join you today. Where are you lo- based out in? I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, oh, very cool. California. Right in Los Beautiful. Angeles. Beautiful. Well, it's a little bit foggy outside, but we'll survive. We'll survive. Let's dive into it. I was looking at mm-hmm. some of your articles that you have put out uh, uh, on Forbes, and you talk about real estate and a lot of different topics. But I want to pivot because I see a lot of individuals coming into the business and entrepreneurship. What are some of your recommendations and things that you have gone through that you think if you would have known ahead of time, it would have helped you excel much faster than you have done so far? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I, uh, so I'd say number one, the, the biggest thing is to ensure that you have uh, a focus and a vision of where you want to, what you want to achieve. Um, really, a, lo- a lot of entrepreneurs, I think, um, get very busy in the day-to-day operational kind of components of their business. But really what they need to do initially is understand what their roadmap is. What are they trying to achieve? And, you know, once they figure out what they're actually trying to achieve, it becomes a lot more easier to map it out in terms of where you're going. And so I think a lot of entrepreneurs, and especially myself, I think if I uh, had a very clear vision from the very, very beginning, that would have helped me, you know, uh, accelerate my growth a lot faster than it did. How do I come up with that vision? How do I do that? So I think, number one, you, you want to start off with what your passion is. So, you know, obviously, you know, if you have an ultimate vision for where you want your business to be, where your life is, where you want your life to be, you know, the, the first thing you got to foundationalize is, you know, what are your passions? What, do you, what, do, what, what in a perfect world would your life look like based on what makes you happy? Um, what would your business look like based on what would make you happy? And then from there, you can, you can navigate a lot more easier. Um, so, you know, that's probably the seed that moves you in the direction of where you want to go in terms of, you know, acquiring that vision. Do you need the assistance of somebody else to come up with those planning? Or should you do it yourself? And then do you run it by someone? How do you know you're on the right track? That's my question. What if I wrote something that's not realistic? Or with my planning, I'm not going to get there. Or I miscalculated how much time it takes, how much money it takes, or frankly, how much effort it takes to get there. Right. No, yeah. So, you know, what I like to look at is you have a vision, right? And your vision is kind of the ultimate kind of destination, right? And that can always change, go higher, lower, whatever it might be. But you have a general idea of what you want your life or your business to look like. That, I think the blocking and tackling aspect of that, though, the, the tactical kind of component of that is your goals. So, you know, you have an ultimate vision, but then the question becomes, what actions every day, every week, every month are you going to take to reach that vision? And so I think the goals become a very great, become a great goalpost for you to kind of measure as a metric how you're moving towards that vision. So every year, if your vision is to, for example, own 100 homes, you know, in, in 20 years, for example, well, then every, every year you should have a set number of homes that you acquire leading up to that vision. And so I think those goals will hold you accountable and they'll let you know that you're going in the right direction. Um, going to your question with regards to should anyone else be involved? Absolutely. I think your vision is your vision. You know, no one can tell you what that is, but... When it comes to goals and how to reach those goals, having a mentor, having someone who can guide you along the, the roadmap, um, who's been there, done that, is so important. Kind of just, you know, what you guys are doing right now, helping people get information um, to, to kind of figure out if, they, if, if they're reaching the goals in the, in the way they should be. In real estate, will the same rule apply if I wanted to become either a broker or agent or that, or does that take different avenue because i feel like as a as someone who's in real estate i feel like you have to put yourself out a lot more and you need to educate your clients a lot more about what you do is not necessarily just 
I want to buy this home, or I want to buy this shopping center. I think a lot of people think it's that simple, but I feel like there's a lot more that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I would say in, in, a, in, a general in a general way, yes. You know, if, if you're a real estate broker or agent or, or, or mortgage broker, um, it's just that your goals have changed, right? So as an investor, your goals are going to be acquiring more assets, you know, maybe building an organization, maybe buying a hotel, you know, or working your way up to that, or maybe buying an apartment complex. Um, with a, a mortgage broker, a real estate agent, you know, th those are different functions of the real estate business, but they're obviously in that realm also going to have goals. Maybe it's going to be sales targets. Maybe it's going to be a certain amount of deals closed by the end of the year. So I, I think the semantics change, but not the actual um, general idea of moving towards the ultimate vision that you want to acquire. When you were building your business, average day, how many day, how many hours would you have? Would, did you spend in building your business to this point? Like, what was your longest? What was your shortest? Because I feel like a lot of people, especially in entrepreneurship, moving from nine to five. Because I see that transition happening for a lot of individuals because of the crisis we're going through. I think a lot of people miscalculate that. How would you come up with it? Or what? Did you yeah. Do? Yeah, so I would say, you know, when we, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the uh, real estate investment business and, and we initially acquired our first hotel in Atlanta nine years ago. And, um, you know, to acquire my first hotel, I needed to raise capital because I didn't have that much. And I needed to basically raise capital from family members, friends. And because it was close acquaintances that I had raised the capital from, the level of responsibility and burden that I felt was significant, right? So, you Would know, you there's go two back things. And change it right now, just so you don't have that pressure on you. Would you go back? If you go back, you would change it. Um, I I wouldn't change it, and and the reason being is because I think you know, uh, you need something to sharpen you up uh, initially, and having that pressure really, you know, it sharpens you, right? And and it makes you stronger. So I mean, you because I had that level of responsibility fire under your butt, but th th you use the better vocabulary. Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think so. Having that pressure on me really forced me to a work long hours. Going back to your question, but also um, it, it it forced me to. People don't talk about this very much, but it forced me to save money. You know, because I didn't want to waste investor money. I wanted to. Um, I wanted to make sure that we were using it to the best of our ability. So for our first hotel, I lived in the hotel for two years. I ran the front desk, you know, 12 hours a day. Um, you know, we ran with three or four employees. I mean, we did what we needed to do to make sure the business is successful because I couldn't go back to my mother and my uncles and, and my sisters and all the people who had invested and been like, sorry, you know, I, I just couldn't, you know, it didn't work. So you know, you just have to, you know, grind it out and, and work those extra hours. I'd say if you're passionate enough as well, looking at today, I'm probably working similar to the same number of hours as I did back then, just because I enjoy it. It doesn't feel like work to me. You know, this is, this is my passion. It's something that, you know, is, is a part of me. How important is it for entrepreneurs to have the right partner? Because I know a lot of times our loved ones hold us back from working and those 12 hours. Were you married when you were doing those 12 hours from this? I wasn't. I wasn't. I, I, was, I was single. I, you know, th this is when I was about 27. And so, you know, not married, no kids at the time. And um, so, yes, you know, absolutely. It's, it was a different lifestyle for me. Um, I, I think that, you know, it becomes much more complicated as you build a family because obviously you have to sacrifice. You can't just say, I'm going to work 24-7 and not spend any time with my kids or my wife because that's not being fair to them. And so I think, you know, there has to be a negotiation between husband and wife. And, um, and I'll, I'll say one thing, I think making your significant other or your family members a part of the process in some way, shape or form involves them and engages them. And that makes the process easier as well. But should you enroll your loved ones in your passion? Would that make it easier? I, I think you have to be very careful in how you do it. So when I say involve, um, it might not be becoming a partner in the business. It might just be 
you know, weekly having a sit down and, and just, j- just helping them understand what you've been doing all week and helping them understand what's going on in the business. Um, you know, it, it's going to vary between everyone, um, depending on your business and depending on, on, on your circumstances, you know, personally. So, you know, with me, you know, I, I engage my wife in, in, the, um, in the administrative component of our business and different parts of our business. And she enjoyed that. And so it worked and it flowed really well. Um, but, you know, it's, everyone's different. I, I think it just really depends on your, you know, on your really kind of personal circumstance. But, I mean, I, I agree with that because having the wrong partner could definitely be costly. Not in just monetary. Right. Just in, in lost potential or opportunity. Because if you don't enroll them, then it causes other issues. But I think that's the whole entire... I think what I want to do is I want to get a panelist for that podcast. I want to get like three married people with kids and then three single guys and then have them go at it and then yeah. have the wives not be in the room and then bring the wives back in the room and then the, <laughs> like definitely that would be cool. get divorced after that because <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to stir the, the, the pot up really good. So if you had one recommendation for entrepreneurs during the crisis that we're going through, what would be one of your recommendations? How do we navigate through this? Yeah, that, no, that's that's a great question. I, I would say one of the mistakes I made at the in the last recession is as an investor, I was so excited that I was getting assets at such great prices. You know, right at the at the beginning of the recession, at the peak of it, I purchased a whole bunch of real estate. And, and in Atlanta, you know, in, in really great, in, in great areas, they were basically giving away real estate. I was buying homes for sometimes 12000 to $20,000 a, a, a pop. And, you know, what happened is, is that I bought so much right at the beginning of the recession that the prices of the real estate kept going down. And so if I had actually waited or tiered my investment strategy, so bought a few at the beginning, bought another in 90 days, bought another in 90 days, bought some on the way going up, my returns actually would have been exponentially better. So I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to any investors or anyone who wants to take advantage of the opportunities coming out of this recession is be patient. Um, capital preservation is key. And then as you're, as you're conserving your capital, ensure that you're tearing out your investment strategy. You're not just buying everything at one time. You're doing it in intervals. So you get the full swing and the full benefit of the investments that you made during that time. That's an excellent advice. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. Hopefully we'll get to do more a lot because that's a, that's a huge topic of how you do that and how you got to get educated in the fundamental of the business and how, you know, get the wisdom of people that have gone through the turbulences and challenges and how you combine these two and make the final decisions. So I appreciate you taking this time. Hopefully we'll get to do more. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Take care. You got to talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye.